Welcome to the Pint with Shawnee B coming to you from South London in Dulwich. I'm at the home of one of Britain's preeminent cardiologists who would be the first cardiologist on the show and possibly the first medical person that we've ever had to speak to. Hopefully not. (laughs) I'm here today to talk to him about lots of stuff. The guy is uh, not just one of the great medical people of Britain, but he's also got lots of other strings to his bow and we hopefully touch on them. I'm welcoming Richard Schilling to the podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I was going to try and memorise all the things that you do right now as your main job, so why don't you cover that? Okay, so um, I work as a cardiologist at Bart's Heart Centre. I'm a professor of cardiology at Queen Mary University of London. And at the moment, I'm also the director of strategy and commercial for the Bart's Hospital okay. uh, itself. So, What does that last bit entail? So that uh, basically involves being the sort of clinical lead for the strategy for the hospital. So we get all the clinical teams, ask them to give us their strategy, and then we sort of put it all together into a cohesive plan. We were having this interview around the time when there's people on the street protesting against what's happening to the NHS in Britain. What, What does it look like from your side of the fence? Well, I'm in a very lucky position in that Bart's Hospital doesn't have an A&E. So we're a highly specialised hospital ring fence from the nightmare at the end mm. that the A&Es are having to face at the moment. Yeah. Um, Is it primarily an A&E driven well, malaise? Or? Well, you know, the, the, that's the entry point into the hospital. Mm. And so they're the gatekeepers. And so when you have a flu epidemic, they're the ones at the front line having to face that. Yeah. I mean, there's undoubtedly frivolous use of A&Es, but there's also an increasing demand by people that are genuinely sick. Mm. Um, because the population is increasing and getting older and yeah. needing more help. And the money's becoming less. Well, the money's not growing. Yeah. Or significantly, yeah. I mean, the, the government will say it is, but in reality, it's not. I mean, we have a beautiful, perfect storm happening where America has got, like, and I lived there for eight years. So, yeah. I, I mean, you know, just to give you some perspective, my health insurance in Ireland right now, where I live, is something like 120 a month. Yeah. It's a euro. When I was traveling globally, it was 280. Uh, that was for pretty good health insurance globally, excluding America. Yeah. And if I wanted America included, it was 620. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the American system is, is, is you know, the, the, the great line of mixing capitalism with medicine doesn't yeah. work. You know, it, well, it doesn't work for patients. Well, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't work for patients and it doesn't work for anyone, really. (laughs) There you go, right. And I think one of the amazing things about the US is that you have some centres of amazing quality care. But let me give you an example. So one of the procedures that I've dedicated a lot of my research to is a thing called AF ablation, where you take patients who have abnormal heart rhythms called atrial fibrillation and you pass a wire up from the leg and you use that to try and cauterize and get rid of the areas that are promoting the irregular rhythm. In Europe, the death rate with an AF ablation is less than 1 in 2,000. I mean, it's very, very rare. It's tiny. In the US, 1 in 300. Wow. So (laughs) Not caught in time. Well, no, it's just because the quality of the care there is not good overall. So while you have centres of excellence for the vast majority of Americans that get health care, yeah. the care, the quality of the care they get is actually not that great, even though it's incredibly expensive. And so you can extrapolate that, presumably, not just about that thing that you specialise in, but across cancer and lots of other things. Is that fair? Yeah. So the perception in Europe is that America is the greatest standard of health care. And for sure, in some places, mm. it is stratospherically good yeah but for most americans it is no no i agree not, it's yeah it's pretty no, bad over there it's i don't think it's considered but you know but the nhs is held up as one of the greatest things ever you know mm. and this is what, what, one of the reasons that you know a lot of britain is out marching on the street is to mm. protect things like they call it my nhs and yeah. the fact that it was a it was one of the great social things that yeah. was done yeah uh, and, and it's being kind of eroded I, I mean at the moment we have a challenge in that demand's going up and yet we are in an era where we do not feel that rationing is acceptable. When I started off as a doctor, mm. the waiting list for bypass operations were over a year. Uh, you know, there was an element of rationing. And now we don't accept that. But yet we're not prepared to pay. Was that money. means ration? Like if you had money back then, you could get it, jump the queue? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could do it. You could go privately for sure. Yeah. I mean, the four hour wait in A&E 
I've got no evidence for this, but you'd imagine that people will now go to an A&E because it's easier to do that than get to a GP. And so A&Es are under incredible strain. Yeah. Whereas back in the day when you were waiting 12 hours to be treated, they were less likely to go to A&E and more likely to go to their GP for a cold or a sore throat. Yeah. There's some hard decisions that we need to make as a country. Do we say it's free care for everyone and we're just going to have to pay more money? Or are we going to put some limit on the care we offer and a limit on the money we pay? So on your side of the fence, which, you know, you're obviously involved in strategy and all that stuff as well. What do you feel is the right solution? Uh, well, these are my own personal, personal views. views. I, but get I, that, think, I get that. But I mean, also, you're someone who's very yeah. informed. Uh, well, I think you have to have some nominal fee that people pay if they go to an A&E to make right. them think about yeah. Do they really need to go there? Do they really need to go there for mm. a sore ankle? And you have you you should have an element of free care, obviously for people that are hard up or, or you know on yeah. benefits or whatever. Yeah. They they shouldn't have to pay, mm. and that's fine. That you know the country can shoulder that burden. Yeah. But for the vast majority of people that are working that have disposable income, they're carrying a you know a thousand pound phone in their pocket. Yeah, then indeed. then presumably they could pay. Yeah. Fifteen pounds to be seen at A and E, yeah. and make them think about: well, Do I really need to go there? What about the whole Brexit thing? It was the medical side of that was put front and center by the by the government who were mm. promoting, uh, you know, leave, and apparently it was all bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what well, the three hundred and fifty million, whatever a month or a week or whatever. The, the, there was a number Boris had on his bus, right? That yeah. was basically bullshit. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure it was, but but for the NHS. <laughs> Most of us felt very sad when that boat came in because most of our colleagues are not from Indeed, the UK. there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of our colleagues felt a bit betrayed by that boat because yeah. they've come here, they care for people, they, they don't get great salaries. Yeah. Um, and we're bolstered and shored up by Europeans yeah. who come here and help us out. Yeah. I mean, what, what did you think about it as an Irish... Well, I mean, as an, an Irish guy, from a Brexit point of view, I have... Uh, certainly Ireland can't leave... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm a believer that the EU needs to be shaken up mm. and I, don't, I think it's got bloated, fat, lazy and I don't mm. think it's prevented wars from happening and all these things um, and I think people like Macron is a very good step in the right direction because he clearly is rolling his sleeves up and trying to do something different I think him and Merkel if she continues to get things happening there I also felt Britain would be able to leave and would be fine. Like, I mean, Switzerland, maybe it has Nazi gold, but, you know, Switzerland is sat <laughs> in the middle of Europe yeah. for the last whatever. And just, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm not interested. Britain is a, is a robust enough economy, I think, to take it. Yeah. I think it was done for the wrong reasons. I don't think, yeah. I, I, I mean, you may disagree, but I, I've grown up following English football. And I, I would say that Britain is infinitely more racist in the 1970s than it is today yeah. you know and, and, and I think that the you know the Islamophobia and all that kind of stuff I mean I, I, I have some sympathy with mm. discussions on Islam and, and parts of Islam that are, are trying to force their opinions mm. on me from an Irish point of view it has obviously huge ramifications for the north of Ireland and whether we mm. end up back to square one with a hard border and people smuggling x y and z and god knows what going on yeah and then on the other hand, we might be sucking an awful lot of business out of London. So there's yeah. this kind of double-edged sword yeah. for us. Yeah. As far as health is concerned, we have, a, you know, I, I often make the point on the podcast. So when I left Ireland 26 years ago and I'm just back a year, you know, the five things that were problems back in 1996 are yeah. still the five things that are problems today. Are. One of them was a burgeoning, creaking, ineffective health system that yeah. is, you know, something like 2,000 people around the country waiting on trolleys every day. My yeah. joke is when, what happens when we run out of trolleys? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, so we have a health issue, we have an education system that needs help, we've got a homeless system that's terrible, we've got a body politic that just procrastinates and talks and doesn't do anything. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, my view, we have a huge lack of creativity. But that leads me on to the thing that disappointed me most about Brexit was that the arguments for and against were not presented. Correct. And they got away with it. Yeah. You know, the, the leadership that we have today is allowed to get away with poor quality leadership and poor arguments yeah. and we don't hold them to account. And that's a really disappointing thing about the new era of politics. You know, the same is true for the Trump and... Well, as an Irishman, the British politic today is akin to our politics when I was growing up. Mm. Weirdly, we're starting to become a little bit kind of cool and trendy. We've got a homosexual 38-year-old Taoiseach who's doing a pretty good job and we're, yeah. he's bringing young people on board. Mm. 
Okay, and Robert Crony is one of the first two. Is in. We have yeah. a, probably as this is going out, we'll be having a, a, a debate on abortion, which is still illegal. Yeah, um, people feel very strongly about that <laughs> because most of the people are coming over here for abortions, right? Yeah, yeah. so well, it's, got, it's not as if we don't have it. <laughs> yeah. So the hypocrisy of mm. mainly clerical, you know, church-based hypocrisy of we're a very good Holy Catholic country. None of our girls get pregnant, mm. except they go over to England when yeah, they want. Yeah. So you're, you're grand if you want an abortion. You have a few bob in your pocket, yeah. but you can't if you don't. So I mean, yeah. you know, there's, 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 you're just like, what about things like Sicko? You know, the Michael Moore movie and these kind of. I, me- I remember one piece in it where a guy had lost two fingers in a lathe. Yeah. And they had been recovered and mm. wrapped in ice and brought to a hospital and the guy had a discussion he could only afford with his medical to have one of them sewn back on yeah i think it was a, a ring and a pinky he had to sit there like with still bleeding mm. before they did anything yeah and they had both his fingers yeah and said which one do you want mm. like are you going to throw the other one down the toilet like i mean that is and i just couldn't understand that was it over drama dr- dramatizing well, i think it's probably not i mean if you if you look at private healthcare in the UK it's great but they make damn sure you can pay before they give you anything because it's a business I mean one of the great things about the NHS is that uh, first of all it offers care regardless of your wealth but yeah. secondly they're highly incentivized to prevent a lot of the system is actually set up to produce disease prevention rather than yes. dealing with whereas in the right. US you're incentivized to let the disease yeah. happen yeah. because then you can make Never more money treating it yeah Big pharma. GPs are incentivized to manage blood pressure. One of the reasons why heart attack rates have dropped in the UK is simply because GPs are really managing blood pressure very, very well. But they're under increasing strain now because they're underfunded and given all sorts of targets that it's really tough to to manage. So it's a, it's a big challenge. And the NHS is a something we should absolutely preserve and hold up as a great institution. Just picking up on that point you just made about big pharma, so things like statins, right? Mm. And also the role of diet and the role of cholesterol. And, and, you know, what's happening now with, you know, triglycerides and whether fat is as bad for you as everyone thinks it is and maybe Mm. sugar is the killer and all that stuff that's happening around diet right now, which has a direct relationship to things like brain, heart, cholesterol issues. Where do you sit on on that as, as one of the top heart guys? It's all pretty much common sense. You know, there's a lot of science and a lot of science used to confuse things. But if you, if you, none of these things will stop you dying of a heart attack. They'll just skew the odds in your favour. So you, if you eat a healthy lifestyle and you exercise regularly and you don't smoke and you mm. don't take, you know, I'm not doing like, very well so far on this list. <laughs> <laughs> you don't take cocaine in huge <laughs> amounts, then, then you're more likely to live longer than others but of course people always give you oh well you know so and so dropped dead when he was running a race at 50 yeah. and so my uncle charlie it's smoked till he was 90, 90. Yeah. and of course you know it's the system they're outliers it's, yeah so you're it's you're just reducing curve. your risk yeah you know like if you wear a seat belt you're less likely to die in a car but to crash. talk to you about the lgl hdl kind of particle size issue which is a big issue right which is coming out on like the, the amount of fat you have blo- blobbing around if they're big blobs they're good if they're small blobs they can they can they can cause uh, arterial clogging and all that. I mean, I'm very amateur about this, well, but I have no, I have not, studied it. To, to be honest, Johnny, I'm not much better because okay. my my speciality is heart rhythm. So my okay, right. my so HDL LDL cholesterol really refers to the plumbing and the uh, narrowing up of the arteries. Right. And so LDL low density lipoprotein is a is a bad cholesterol. Yeah. And HDL is felt to be a good cholesterol. Yeah. And if you have low LDL, then you're less likely to get clogging up at an early age than you would if you had a high LDL. Right. Maybe to get on to what happened to me. So yeah, I, on, I was like... Um, happened to you. So, you know, as I said on, my, on your checklist, I, I don't perform too well. I'm a smoker, drinker. Not a huge amount of drugs, but um, I was living in Denver and I was feeling shortness of breath for about a year. I mentioned it a couple of times to GPs and they said they'd, you know, they'd te- check me out. And as far as I get, just need to catch my breath a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, I, and the only way I can describe it is not, not, no heart pain, but an awareness. It was as if I could feel my heart sometimes working. It wasn't like it was working over time, but I was conscious of my heart there. You're not supposed to be conscious of it, right? So let, let me see if I can describe <coughs> the symptom. Like you're sitting there perfectly happy. Yeah. 
and then suddenly you may feel a skip, but you could then feel you need to take a deep breath, yeah. and then you feel your heart giving a really strong not beat, even perhaps. that, but just like, I can just feel it. Work. I can feel yeah. something happening here. And then the problem with this is that I got it checked out. Everyone said you're fine, and mm. then I'm like, all right, but like you know, years are going by, and I'm just thinking I'm going to hit the deck one day. With mm. something's going to go here. And I was in uh, Denver, uh, again, at altitude, right? So mm. I'm, I'm yeah, high in the mountains. High, yeah. And I'm coming down Saturday with my girlfriend. And I just go, you know what? I feel like we should pull into the hospital. Now, one of the things I learned in the advertising business is one of the reasons men die earlier than women is because men go, I'm fine. I'm mm. fine. Women are much more kind of, I'm not fine. I'm going to get it checked out. Again, I had perfect health insurance. So, you know, they talk about open wallet surgery over mm. there. So I come mm. in. Put me on an EKG. The girl who's doing it said, I, did, I could just see her face. And I said, um, what's wrong with that? Because it's printing out. And she goes, oh, I don't know anything about this. 90 seconds later, 20 people rush into the room, including a priest. So I've gone mm. from basically, shall I go in to two hours later? We're going to have an operation on you. It's going to take four hours. You're going to have to be awake for it. We're going to rebuild your heart. You're either having a major heart attack, have had a major heart attack, or about to have a major heart attack, or all three of those. And uh, the priest is here to give you the last rites. And suddenly my whole world goes, okay. Mm. And a weird thing aside, I was kind of cooler than I thought I would be. Mm. But that appro- near approach of death, maybe because it was so sudden. But I was kind of like, oh, anyone I offended or want to make peace with or any regrets. So within two hours, I'm on the slab. Mm. The table the slab's off to the uh, table. Okay, no, I'm on, well, I'm getting ready for yeah, whatever. You know, the slab is where you go. Oh, that's if the things death. go bad. Sorry, it's more, yeah. <laughs> I'm on the table, sorry. Um, and I remember saying a few things. One was like, keep cracking jokes because, you know, someone's got to collect the body and go, he's mm. cracking jokes on him, which I know you guys hate because these guys hate it. Because <laughs> uh, they weren't very good jokes. Um, two was to try and die like a man because mm. I was a bit scared and I'm not really good with pain. Mm. Uh, and three was you know weirdly was was some weird kind of otherworldly thing of well if this is part of death then bring it on because I'm in, in, intrigued to see what it's like and and I wasn't as scared and I don't have kids and I don't have people responsible for me so it's mm. like no no video so anyway they go in through my groin with camera they're going to rebuild my heart quote mm. unquote and put stents in right so 35 minutes into the operation the surgeon comes up to me and goes this is a bit embarrassing. He said, uh, we're coming out. Your heart is is perfect. I heard them mention this guy's got the heart of a 20-year-old. And I said, I don't know how that got in there, which mm. was one of those jokes I didn't like. But within 35, 40 minutes, I'm in ICU and it's like, you're fine. And I'm like, whew, okay. <laughs> that was a close shape. Then they were going to release me at about 11 o'clock that night. And I said, mm. well, I don't, I, you can have the bed. I don't clearly need the ICU, but like, I still have this issue. And I want you, since you've decided to go in, tell me what the hell's wrong. So they did a, a blood die thing the next day and that was fine and they left me going with the with with the kind of diagnosis that this sort of stuff happens when you're in your 40s right yeah a subsequent doctor a year later in denver said that basically i think my heart is slightly off tilt does right. that make sense to you like it's it's not quite yeah straight and that's what's causing ekgs to kind of go a little bit weird which is right. causing them to misread them which is causing them to go with that and i still wasn't happy so like for four years after that i was still getting these symptoms Every doctor, cardiologist said, you're fine. And I still felt any, like twice or three times a month. Sorry, Sean, just before we go on, can yeah. I just check that you are insured, aren't you, for this consultation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm thinking, no, but I have to give you all the information. No, no, I know just, you're interested I'm just in this. Teasing, you're I'm just interested teasing. in this. <laughs> so what happens? So, you know, four years goes by and I'm still literally, not all the time, and I'm, I'm, you know, I haven't changed much. And then only last year, somebody said to me, you know, I bet you it's coffee. And I go, it's not coffee. I've been drinking coffee all my life. Like, I've been get, drinking lots of coffee all mm. my life. And there's some coffee thing, which is if you don't have the genes to break down caffeine, you leave a layer and a layer and a layer and a layer. And over a big period of time, you're throwing cups of coffee apparently in on top of, you know, whatever. You, this is all probably nonsense to you. But I gave up coffee. Maybe there was placebo. I don't know. But as soon as I gave up coffee, everything went away. So here's, here's a really beautiful... Uh example of medicine overrating itself or, or misunderstanding its role in the world so i i think that all along you had probably what's called ectopic beats where your heart skips and misses beats the heart's a pump and it uses an electrical signal to keep it going yeah. and every cell is electrically active and so if you do an ecg for long enough you'll record ectopic beats mm. in people everyone has them some people can go through periods when they just get them more often than others and mm. 
no one understands why. So a few years ago, doctors had the idea, well, look, let's see whether if we suppress these ectopic beats with drugs, particularly in the high-risk patients that have had heart attacks, maybe we can make them less likely to have cardiac arrest. So they did this trial and they had to stop both trials because the ones that were given the drugs were dying, dying. and the ones that were given the placebo were fine. But when you see a, a, an ECG abnormality, it is a medical reaction to go, oh, well, there's something we need to do here, rather mm. than a reaction saying, well, hang on, what's the problem and why are we doing something? Yeah. And caffeine can, in some patients, make them more frequent and, and mm. give you those symptoms. I guess the point I'm making is that we have a great tendency in medicine to want to do something about something, yeah, yeah. particularly if you're paid to do it, yeah. and that can sometimes lead to more harm than good. Like you ended up having an angiogram, which has a one in a thousand risk of a serious problem. Yeah, uh, thanks whereas... for telling me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but the the, thing, the the single most important thing for improving our longevity is good hygiene. And good food. <laughs> well, not, back, to your, to do with doctors. back to your point about prevention. You know, mm. like the, mm. as you said, the American system is geared to make something happen. Let yeah. me spend some money. I mean, like yeah. I often wondered if I didn't have the car that I went in with, yeah, would I have had it that kind of panicky story. treatment? Yeah. It was a great. You, you like this? I, I ended up like about eight months later being up in MIT in Harvard, and I met the head one of the one of the top medical guys there, who's a big old Santa Claus look alike guy, and he was laughing his head off when I told this story to him. Yeah. He said, "The problem is we all go to college as doctors, and we all learn. We haven't a clue half the time. Half yeah. the time we're just guessing." You know, yeah. he said, "Depends on who you're getting guessing." Yeah, you know, if you get a yeah. good guesser, yeah. you'll probably do 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 it. And that's exactly right. When a doctor says, "I know exactly what's going on." Be suspicious. <laughs> We're making an educated guess based yeah. on our previous experience and statistics from studies. We're yeah. not, you know, the human body is still so unbelievably complex. We don't understand how it works. Really. Filter me now into the conversation when you just use that word because I want to talk a little bit to you. I mean, it's not your field, I know, but I'm intrigued about the whole urgency with which we're moving down this AI route mm. and it is happening really quickly and the problem mm. is it's happening with no checks and balances yeah you know like there, there could be an Ozymandias type guy who's creating a mm. fleet of drone like mm. humanoids that can just emerge out of Antarctica probably mm. not anytime soon but yeah where do you see technology and all of that stuff going so I had a very heated conversation with a friend of mine only this week about this whole issue because he's right. into computers um i've had interactions with a number of different divisions of google and they come at it with an absolute belief that ai will solve the problem and that is a big worry for me because if, if a scientist comes at a problem believing that they can solve it and they know all the answers then they're gonna fuck it up because you should go into a solving a problem with the absolute belief you don't know what's going on and you hope that you might get there. You're not even sure it. what the problem is. Yeah. Let's face it. <laughs> like, what is the problem? Yeah. So their, their belief is that you throw data at the problem, enough volume of data, you'll solve it, no matter what the quality of the data. So, you know, Fitbit and, and mm. these other things being a good example. Yeah. But actually, the data you get from these types of systems are completely hopeless. I mean... Mm. You know, they're very inaccurate and they're not a marker of disease no. or, or, or anything. So I think AI will solve some problems some point later on down the line. But at the moment, I think it's at least 10, 20 years off. Genetics being okay. a perfect example of this. We thought that, we could be, you know, you... In the 60s, we thought we'd crack that, yeah. Yeah, you sort the human genome and mm. you'll know the answers. And now it turns out we only just beginning to understand yeah. what the question might be yeah. because it's not just the genes. Yeah. It's the way the genes interact with one another, how the environment interacts with the genes. So mm. disease is a lot more complex, or most disease is a lot more complex than just one gene causing a problem. Mm. I guess another example is that we, in heart rhythm management, have been implanting devices into patients for a long time now pacemakers mm. Mm. defibrillators and they give us a lot of information they can transmit remotely mm -hmm. and give us a lot of data about what's going on and they still are not able to prevent patients coming into hospital with things like heart failure because even with these implantable devices that measure the impedance across your chest they're still not sensitive and accurate enough to mm. anticipate a heart failure problem, for example. So I think we're still a way off. Are we being hysterical? 
Uh, you mean in fear? The AI the, thing, yeah. The, the, the coming of the robots and robot overlords. Uh, it's not my area. My, no, pers- uh, you know, my, my personal feeling is probably not. Yeah, right. You know, it's yeah. a tool that we're going to use like anything yeah. else, and ultimately, it's got a plug. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, there is that. Well, that, that's that's actually the main check and balance right now. Yeah. Is switch it on and switch it <laughs> switch it yeah. off and switch it back on again, mm. which is which is fine until the machine knows that you're going to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it comes up with the with a with a with a reboot because yeah. we've taught it to try and think around problems. Yeah. There's a great one which was about. Um, if you tried to get a machine to produce, I think it was like two strawberries, take one strawberry and make an exact replica mm. of it on a plate. Mm. And that sounds like an easy and very benign kind of thing to ask a machine to do. But the machine will go through every known possibility of doing that, including possibly blowing up the world yeah. <laughs> to see if that works. Yeah. That didn't work. Oh, wait. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just to make another strawberry, yeah. right? Mm. And that, that there's no sort of overseer that goes hey stop doing that or you know you got, got to go, which you have in medicine yeah but then if you think about I guess I mean the Hippocratic you know, Oath the, the argument I put back to you is that AI it can't do any worse than we're already doing I mean we're afraid of AI and yet we're not afraid of True. plastics and you've got fish being hooked out of the sea full Indeed. of it well I, I guess the point is we haven't we, we well, sorry but maybe by the time this has gone out Donald Trump still hasn't put his finger on his big nuclear button yeah that's an interesting one to think about with regards to a computer who may not have the kind of nuance and kind of and we just go okay no i know in this situation when this guy's challenging me and there's a danger of this going on to the hawaii and this i need to preemptively strike boom yeah Uh, and that would be an example to me of ai (laughs) doing something without the kind of empathy and nuance and sort of stuff that that humans bring sometimes to an equation even if they are bad well, here's, okay, let me give you an example where it might find it challenging to work. One of the things that I do is to uh, put in things called implantable defibrillators, which are basically little pacemaker devices that go under the skin. They monitor the heart rhythm and they deliver a shock if you have a cardiac arrest. Brilliant. It must be a great thing. Why doesn't everyone have them? But then if you have a 75-year-old guy sitting in the room with you who's yeah. got heart failure... And we know that patients who have heart failure and scarring their hearts are at greater risk of a cardiac arrest. So the knee-jerk reaction is, I've put a defibrillator in, it'll stop you dying from a cardiac arrest. Importantly, it doesn't stop you having the cardiac arrest, it just delivers the shock to stop it. That may fix you. But then you have to open up the conversation, how do you want to die? Because the defibrillator will not allow you that death in your bed or dropping down dead suddenly, it will change the way you die. And indeed, some recent research suggests that, particularly for older patients, it doesn't actually make you live any longer. It just changes the way you die. Makes it more painful. Well, yeah. Possibly. Or, or, you know, a slow deterioration or drowning in your own fluids of heart failure. So these are really difficult questions. Difficult conversations that you have to have with patients. And of course, the family with them say... They've got to have the defibrillator, and the patient's going. Mm, yeah. I'm not sure that that's what I want. Yeah. Well, so the these... DNR business is interesting because, like, I even had to chat with my father, who's still hale and hearty in his eighties. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, it's hard to. Have, I'm the eldest kid, and I wanted just to make sure I knew what his wishes were. He's thankfully, as I said, not in any trouble. But like he did, I said, under no circumstances, switch me off. Yeah. Right? You know, and then, mm. you know, he's a very religious guy, and I guess mm. he's coming out from that angle. Whereas I'd be the opposite. I mean, do you think we'll end up with um, euthanasia in our lifetime soon enough? Well, we, we already do. In and Switzerland. Frank, yeah. Well, and frankly, we already do to some degree in the UK. Hospice care and all that, yeah. Well, no, I mean, in when I was uh, a junior doctor, you know, it was well accepted that you would just give patients enough painkiller that they wouldn't be uncomfortable. Um, and it was never formally recognised. Yeah. Now, thank goodness it is. And we discussed that with the patients and we discussed it then. But you... Mm. It's a lot of it was for religion. Like, there's a religious thing here as well that just is very, you know, aiding suicide and all this kind of stuff. And there's, you know, the ethics of that. But, like, we're great with our pets. Yeah. <laughs> That's like, oh, poor old Fido. But Fido could be going, I oh, know, I can still hobble along on one, on, on three legs. But... Uh, 
You know, I don't understand why people do not feel that patients have the right to decide yeah. what they do. Why, why should patients not have the right to choose whether they live or die? It doesn't make sense to me that we give them every other decision, but not that. The most well, important it, it, decision And they except have. women and abortion in Ireland as well, where the yeah. same thing comes into play. Where Although you could argue there's another life involved there, but if, this is yeah. not. This is even simpler. Yeah. This is your own life. It's your yeah. own control. Why, yeah. why shouldn't you have yeah. the right... And people will say, well, they don't have capacity. Well, you can, sometimes, you sometimes, can, yeah, you can protect. Or you from can put that. in a will. Yeah, you can protect from that. But so yeah. you were a junior doctor. Talk to me a bit about how a guy ends up being, you know, because you were similar vintage-ish, you know. Yeah. And uh, what was your background? Where were you born? What was your what was your life journey like? Brought up in Hackney. Right. My dad was a GP. I didn't do that well at school. Uh, Not good if you want to be a doctor. No. I um, spent a year working in, I was a photocopying engineer. Pronto print or something. Well, yeah. I don't, no, I just yeah. worked in an office fixing photocopiers okay. and, and photocopying things. And yeah, I mean, let's be clear, I would never get into medical school now. I wasn't allowed in the first time. I spent a year doing this clerical job, realized this is not the way I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Didn't get in the second time and then someone dropped out and right. they offered me a place. I just scraped it. Was your father someone pushing you into it or did you always look up to him and go I want to follow in his footsteps well actually my grandfather was also a doctor. okay so was, did you feel responsibility as a kid to no I didn't know but obviously I had that world available yeah, to around me around you yeah. and I think that influenced me you yeah. know I saw that that was a potential opportunity and a possibility did you have brothers and sisters I do oh. uh, and they're not doctors okay. my brother runs a very successful furniture company and my sister works in the US so I got in at by the skin of my teeth yeah. and then I spent, I did okay at medical school. I wasn't, you know, mm. incredibly, you know, academic. I just grew, I matured late. So I did my house jobs, uh, which is the first year after medical school. And then I couldn't get a job after that. And then I managed to land a job in Hull. Which Don't go to Hull apparently if you... Got <laughs> <defense>. <laughs> so Hull was the making of me because um, it was really super busy. Um, I was the only person there interested in cardiology at that time. So were you now like in an A&E working 27 hours a day kind of I thing? I was working on a... So, okay, so <laughs> I did a coronary care job. I did an intensive care job. The coronary care job, we did a one in three with prospective cover. So it meant if someone was away, you covered them. So it was one in two. You slept on the, on the ward. And I was earned bit, pittance I was a bit loony by the end of that and that still goes on more so now right with the, uh, no it's less it's, there's a thing in Ireland now where the doctors have to wear a badge to say that they're acting up is the word mm. do you know what that means mm. so they have this thing where, which acting up of course to me means like you're being a brat <laughs> yeah. but they have, they, yeah. have, they, have, they have some new thing coming in where because these doctors are being run off their feet that you, you know you have doctors having to come in yeah, yeah. Just out of school, going, yeah. I think oh, hell, the problem is yeah. your pointer. Yeah. They have to wear a badge. So I'm oh, right, kind of okay, a shit doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, So you went through all that. So what? I, I've never spoken to some. I, I have huge respect for doctors and particularly nurses. People who who you know, I put teachers in there. People who do a lot of great things. And I work in advertising and I get paid a load of money. And these people are working much harder than me and doing something much more important than I did, and getting half the salary or quarter the salary. What was it like? It was phenomenal. Right. Tell me why. It was a massive, huge privilege. So the nurses all knew that you were working all the hours that God sends. And as long as you were decent to them, they really looked after you. It was a bit like being in a rugby team or being at war. You know, there's a camaraderie there that you get in situations of adversity. And then on top of that, you have the amazing privilege of looking after patients who... Purposefully, yeah. Yeah, who know that you've been working long hours and are really, by and large, really decent people as well, who are just grateful that you're doing the best you can for them. So it's it's an incredible, incredible job and an incredible opportunity. Well, I hope everything uh, goes uh, better with the NHS. Coming away from medicine, tell me about your interest in flying and where that came from. Um, So I... Uh, was taken away by the anaesthetist that I work with. He gets very upset if I call him my anaesthetist because, right. you know, he's, he's a doctor in his own right. Yeah. <laughs> so he's a, he was a pilot and he took me on a trip to Jersey. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Sort of a Cessna type thing? Or? It was in, yeah, it was in a little twin engine yeah. thing. 
And so I thought, well, this this is came at a time in my life where I still wanted some academic stimulation, still wanted some challenges, and right. flying offered that. But it also offered me the chance to understand how aviation works and works so much better than medicine in terms of safety. Yeah. So I interesting did a private pilot's license. I uh, did an instrument rating, and then I did a. Um, so what did you find? What were the what were the parallels? And- so the the really interesting thing is that in medicine, still, if you want safety, they say you do it this way, and that's the policy. In aviation, they say you do it this way because someone did it that way and they fucked up and everyone died. They have a much better way of teaching why you have to use this type of safety precedent. Yeah. Plus, of course, you know, if you fuck up as a pilot, you're going down with everyone else, whereas a doctor Indeed, is very serious that bit. I wonder uh, what medicine would be like if it was like whatever patient you were treating. Oh, my God. You were, you got, that's a movie <laughs> yeah. in that. That would be yeah. a great movie. Yeah. It's like Sully, you know, yeah. the, the, the guy. It's who an amazing loved, film. Great it? movie. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, and I remember being in, in, in New York when that happened. You have two kids who are, you can, listeners can probably hear outside, um, being wrangled. When did they come along? And where, so your career, did it, did it take off? And did you, so, when did you feel like it, as a doctor? Because I, I always have this with any of my friends who are doctors. It, they, you know, it, it, to me, it felt like they were like working for nothing until they were like nearly 30. It's kind of a very weird mm. uh, salary trajectory. Yeah. Um, when did it all start happening for you? When you felt like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm now sort, you know, not sorted, but I've got, I've got it all under control. So I um, met my wife Claire when I was a registrar. So I think I was about thirty-four. Or so registrar. That sounds like a quite a lowly job. Yeah. So it's just before a consultant. Right. Okay. So I met her a couple of years before I got made a consultant. She was right. a medical student. I'd had a pretty good time and uh, then met Claire and fell in love with her and then we kind of settled down life was a bit more stable a bit more money yeah but you're right because it's fine for me I'm a bloke yeah I could live everything and then have kids at the age of 41 or whatever and everything's fine whereas if you're a woman Mm. I think it's a much harder deal because you're still working long hours and no money and you've got to have kids yeah so yeah it was around Late, I mean, yeah. being between 30 and 40, I mean, it, you, it's it, it is the seven or eight years, yeah, that most of us. I didn't even go to college, I started working at 18, but like you know, a lot of my friends are 23. But then there's the medical people or the architects that are coming out like 28, 29 before yeah. they're starting to earn, earn a cost need, and being worked into the bone. Do you need that much money though? I mean, no, I, no, but you're I, talking to the right guy about that. I mean, I've quit the whole app business because I just hate yeah. it. You know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't give you know, the, the thing you talked about purpose is completely lacking in the advertising business. So, what, actually, was, what was the best time of your looking back? What would you say was the best period of your life then? In terms of this only came up about two weeks ago, and yeah. I even brought it up today with, with, with uh, my sister and my girlfriend. Here's my theory on this I never can think of a year that was great yeah in general yeah i can think of a few bad years mm. x died lost that job lost that girlfriend yeah but i can't go 2005 i mean short of my football team doing well or something like that but the last two years of my life 16 mm. and 17 in my view have been probably the greatest years of my life yeah when i quit working haven't got, had much income mm. but have lived learned started re-educating myself on yeah on, on things fallen in love again and 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 had this weight of what i now look as meaningless mm. like when you make an ad for a nappy mm. the amount of time that goes into it given what you do yeah. right? <laughs> this is similar you know and it goes on television and yeah. i sit back and go right you know you come home to claire and you have dinner and you save someone's life I come home, my nappy ad is on. I mean, yeah. There's a huge purposeful imbalance going on there. But know? it's not, but it's, I don't think it's only just that. I think the, if you're intelligent and you have some element of drive, doing the same thing day in, day out does your head in. Uh, and it's true of medicine, it's true of everything else. If you've got less than much to imagine, some GPs are really struggling because 10 years down the line, they're still doing the same thing. And they can self medicate. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say anything about that. No, no, but, no. but um, 
But I think one of the great things about most medical jobs is you can change it. You can flex. When you get bored of doing that, you can do something else. You can do some research. You can become a professor. You can become a manager. You know, there's a, a constant ability to change things. Mm. And I would say to people, younger people listening, if anyone tells you you can't do something, tell them to go fuck themselves. Yeah, I agree. And the second thing I would say is think about what's going to happen. It's, you know, you say this to young people, they never do. But think about where you're going to be 10 years down the line. Mm. And is that still where you want to be? Because two, three years seems great, loads of money and blah, blah, blah. Mm. But is it still something you want to be doing 10 years down the line? If not, think about, well, how am I going to change it and move mm. it to the direction I want to be? Because the point you make, I see it all the time in the city. People yes, make a yeah. lot of money, but they're really meaningless, depressed. Because but you have to look at what you did, going back to what you said earlier, which was... Uh, even though you had your grandfather and your father and you had medicine around you, you were working in a photocopy. You're, there's thousands of lives that just continue down that track. Yeah. Hey, I, you know what? I got a job in Pronto Print today. I'm no longer in that office. I'm now earning, you know, whatever. I've got a company van. And, you know, and, and, the, and the rest of your life goes off there. Yeah. So at some point, part of you went, eh, no, I've got, a, I've got a course adjust right now, early. Yeah. And I, I kind of did something similar, but I don't know why I did it. But it's never too late, as you've yeah. shown. It's never too yeah, late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even if I didn't course adjust then, I would have course adjusted later on. You're right. And I have done. I yeah. have done. Yeah. You know, went to Hull. Yeah. Had an amazing. To everyone said, oh, poor thing, why are you going there? It was, yeah. the thing, it was the making of me. Yeah. To the flying thing, you, you, so you now have your own plane. Does that, did that add an extra kind of use? Because I, I love what you said about the, trying to cross pollinate the, the lessons in flying versus the lessons in what you do. Yeah. That bit you clearly. You now have your own plane, and you yeah. you, you fly. You can fly. Can you fly anywhere? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So like, you've got a plane in an airport. You can just go. Do you want to go to Spain today? And you yeah, can yeah. Go. We flew to Ibiza last year. Brilliant. Into Geneva, taking the boys skiing on really? Thursday. So, uh, sorry, this is a really stupid question. Given the sort of uh, where we were, which was quite deep. Do you, can you drop? Can you like say we'll go with the weekend? From now and just what well, do you have to pay like some airport charges or whatever? And uh, yeah, that. ten minutes before you arrived, I yeah. filed my flight plan for Geneva for Thursday, so we're all heading off skiing then. Have you had any scrapes? Yes. Tell me. So I had. So one of the things about aviation training is it teaches you about human behaviour and human factors. Yeah. And yet, even then, I still managed to screw up. So I flew to the City Isles with the family. Yeah. In very windy conditions yeah. I'm rated to fly the instrument approach I flew it and thought okay I'm through I'm on I can see the runway now it's all okay but one thing I hadn't taken into account was that there was a wind blowing across the runway that was far too big for my capabilities right and because I was thinking so much about flying this approach precisely and accurately I hadn't taken into account that crosswind and right. as I landed I went over a little bit to the wing touch twitched and mm. uh, I took off again and diverted new key but I pranged the prop on the way through and it was a real lesson to me to and it was understand. your family and you is that it there's yeah. no co-pilot or anything no it's just right. family and me right. and it made me really it really made me take stock and yeah. Claire and I had a conversation about it and we yeah. dissected why it had happened yeah. and what was uh, the 90 seconds after the aborted landing like uh, that was fine. The okay, worst was the bit hindsight was, like, was... Well, the worst bit was going landing and then looking back on it. Because, of course, you compartmentalise it. Okay, well, I've got to put that aside. I've got yeah. to now get myself to New Key and, yeah. and land there. And it, it really made me think about whether I was the right person to be flying a plane, and, you know, whether I had the right psychology, whether, you know, I hadn't set myself the right parameters to do that. But isn't it like they, they, they always say, like for you know, motor racing drivers or people who drive professionally, you need the scare. I mean, I'm sure it's the same when you were first operating on a heart, you know, where you encounter something that's not, off, that's not on the books and that you then have to, you know, what you were saying earlier about yeah. this is what you're supposed to do. And, you know, I, I guess medicine is, is rife with legal issues and people suing if you don't like them. There's no room for the maverick who goes, you know what, I think we need this to do this to save this patient. Whereas, you know, maybe an aircraft uh, flying, you can, you can take. No, I, I think no? medicine can have just as many as mavericks. But as you get older, I am much less gung ho than I used to be when I was younger. And I Interesting. heard a, a surgeon describe it once beautifully. He said, inside my chest, I've got a graveyard wow. of all the people that I've... How does that affect out. you? Um, it, so 
on Thursday, I looked after a young boy who had an abnormal connection that was causing him a lot of trouble, very, very close to the normal connection of his heart. And he'd already failed uh, two procedures in another place because of the risk of damaging that connection and ending up leaving him with a pacemaker. And a 17-year-old, fit, young guy that's going to change his life. And it's a huge responsibility, hugely stressful, incredibly rewarding if you get it right. But ultimately, occasionally you make mistakes and you've just got to live with that and you've just got to believe that you do the best you can. Mm. It turned out okay for him, but I have made mistakes in the past and I've got to live with those. Yeah. I don't know how you do that. That sounds, I mean, that sounds something that I just I don't even think I could get my, my, my head around that. Because you never think about doctors really in that regard because you're only experiencing them in your own personal interaction with your parent or whatever. And then you go away for a few years and you, but that doctor then the next week has another person with another parent or whatever. And it's just. But one thing that flying's taught me to vocalize or understand a bit more is if you don't accept you make mistakes, you can't avoid making mistakes and you can't get better. So I make mistakes True. and I analyze them and I think about, well, how do I not do that the next time? And then hopefully I won't do it. Yeah. Whereas doctors say, oh, people die. Yeah. They're not the right doctors to have because, yeah. you know, we're human. Last question. What would you say to your younger, particularly your younger self, the, the particularly the photocopying job, younger self, if you could go back and just spend a sentence talking in that person's ear? Um, that's a really interesting question because if we lived it again I wouldn't go back because I don't think I'd be that lucky say that explain that so, you so don't think you'd be lucky if I, if someone, to medicine so if, if someone said to me right I can put you back into an 18 year old body with all the knowledge you have now would you take it oh, that's a different question I'd totally yeah, I totally take that we'd, so, be, we'd be kings of the world no I wouldn't no oh, we would I don't think I would because I have to say I've been so lucky along the road everything has kind of things have gone wrong and it turns out it went right same here but you're saying if the stuff you know now you could suddenly be 18 again so I don't yeah no I wouldn't because mm, I'd there's be, been there's been so I'd many be president things, or something <laughs> there's so many things that I've been lucky yeah. with so that's the reason I say that is I'm not sure what I would say to my 17 year old self except you lucky bastard you know, have a great we got, time. We got, we got there. Yeah. We got there. Yeah, it's going to be all right, mate. I hope it keeps going all right for you. It was a great conversation, and I love having these conversations with people, particularly like yourself, who are in, you know, industries and jobs that I, 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 I never uh, even begin to think about. So thank you very much for being on Fighting Show. Cheers, Thanks. Nice talking to you. You too.